Um, so let's see, I'm a philosophy professor, and some of you are taking this theory of knowledge class, and so I assume you've heard of philosophy before, I hope. <laughs> um, and in case you don't know, what philosophers do is just sort of make things much more difficult. So we ask kind of hard questions, and sometimes the questions don't have clear answers, and that's okay. So I was just learning about what you're doing in the theory of knowledge class, and it's about asking questions which seems to really fit with what philosophers have done for 2,500 years or more. Um, so what I'm going to do is share with you, and I, hopefully you have the handout. There's some extra ones over here if we need to pass those around still. Um, share with you a framework for making ethical decisions, and then we're going to apply it to some cases. Um, and I've done this kind of stuff with all kinds of different audiences, including high school kids. So the last time I think I did this with high school students was um, at a summer camp up in Sequoia Lakes, um, up near Sequoia National Park. And we worked on some of this stuff. And so hopefully I'll get you talking about the case studies and we'll see how that works. Every so often I teach a class at University High School also. So I teach a applied ethics class over there. And then my kids went to Bullard. So in fact, my younger son's a senior, so I've gotten in and talked to his classes every so often. So anyway, this is a cover from um, my ethics textbook. So uh, we use this with, I use this with my students on campus. This is a huge, big, fat book. And it's, I mean, it's like 400 some pages long and it has chapters about everything from abortion to war, death penalty, uh, economic inequality, environmental ethics, animal welfare, and all that stuff. So if you want to talk about any of that stuff, we could do that too. <laughs> um, but we're not going to dig into any of that tonight unless you guys want to. I'm happy to sort of take this wherever you want me to take it as well. So let's start with this uh, just moment of inspiration to kind of get the mood for this. And there's, I'm going to have at least one other inspiration slide to share with you. So Maya Angelou, she says this, no one is free until we all are. Nothing works unless you do. You never get love until you give it. Accept loss, but never be defeated. Do your best, learn more, then do better. I like that. The idea of, you know, we, we do our best, we try to learn some more, and then tomorrow we're gonna have to do a little bit better. Um, okay, so what we're gonna do here, we're gonna talk a little bit about philosophy and how philosophers approach ethics, and it's kind of different from this. So, now, my newspaper column, actually, I do some of this kind of like, I don't know, inspirational stuff. If you're interested, read my column this Sunday. I'm trying to be a little bit inspirational in that column. But really, that's my journalist columnist hat to try to sort of, I don't know, make it fun. When I'm doing philosophy at Fresno State, I put on my philosopher's hat, and it's actually very difficult stuff. So um, we're going to do a little bit more of the philosophical stuff, talk about how hard some of this stuff is. Then I'll talk about a framework for ethical decision making, and then we'll look at some case studies. Okay? You guys need to nod along with me. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so let's see if you know any of this sort of stuff. Know thyself, everything in moderation, the unexamined life is not worth living. Anybody have an idea about who said that? Socrates. Yes, that is Socrates. Socrates is uh, the father of philosophy in the Western world. Congratulations. We wish we had a prize we could give you. <laughs> Anybody else know the answer? We're just afraid to say it. Okay, Socrates, ancient Greece, uh, Athenian. Does anybody know what happens to Socrates? We all do. <laughs> You're right. It's a very good guess. We all die. How did he die? Do you know? He gets executed by the people of Athens. Here's the problem. He's a philosopher, and by, that, by the way, this is a picture of him. He's about to drink the hemlock. If you want any trivial pursuit about Socrates, he's the guy that drank the hemlock. Hemlock is what poisoned Socrates, killed him. He has to drink the hemlock because the people of Athens sentenced him to death because he asked pesky questions. So he described himself as a gadfly that his job, his vocation, his mission in life was to go around and ask difficult questions to pester people. And guess what happens when you ask those kind of questions? People don't like you. 
<laughs> right? So often philosophers, people don't really like philosophers because we ask questions and sometimes the answers are not easy. And we keep asking, which sounds a little bit like what you do in this IB program. This one you may not know. So uh, this is uh, one of the most important philosophers who talks about ethics in the Western tradition. This philosopher says, so act as to treat humanity, whether in your own person or in that of any other, as an end in itself, never as a means only. Anybody have a clue about who said that? It's, it's a good idea if you understand what he's saying. This is Immanuel Kant, who is a German philosopher, one of the most important contemporary, or not contemporary, but modern philosophers. During the Enlightenment period, and look at his dates, he is contemporary with Benjamin Franklin, Thomas Jefferson, the American founders. Kant says, you need to treat everyone, yourself and others, with respect. Don't use people as a means, so don't turn a person into a tool. You know, slavery does that. Slavery turns people into tools. Uh, don't turn people into tools, but respect people as ends in themselves. That's Kant, one of the most profound statements of moral philosophy in our tradition. This one you probably don't know either, but uh, read with me. Actions are right in proportion as they tend to promote happiness, wrong as they tend to produ produce the reverse of happiness. This is the happiness theory of morality. You're probably not surprised to hear that there is a theory called the happiness theory. This is John Stuart Mill, who is the great utilitarian philosopher. So if you come to Fresno State or any university campus and you take an ethics class, you will learn about these two dead white guys. <laughs> Immanuel Kant and John Stuart Mill, these are the leading figures in contemporary philosophical ethics. Notice two different frameworks. On the one hand, Kant says, respect persons as ends in themselves. Mill says, make people happy. And sometimes those two things conflict. Sometimes to respect another person, we may have to do something that makes me or him unhappy. Can you imagine what that might be like? How about this? <clears throat> Your mom says, she's heading out the door, she's had a rough night. She's heading out the door. Your mom says, how do I look? What do you say to her? You always say, you look great, mom. <laughs> Why? Because you want to make her happy. It's about making mom happy. But notice, sometimes you might have to lie to mom to make her happy, which seems kind of disrespectful. Doesn't mom deserve to know that she doesn't look so good today? To respect her is to tell her the truth, but sometimes telling the truth makes people unhappy. Do you see now we have a conflict of values? This is a moral conflict. We call this a dilemma in philosophy land. It's a moral dilemma. OK, we're going to talk about those kind of moral dilemmas. Before we get there, let's talk about the parts of philosophy. And this is just a boring intro to philosophy lecture. So just, if you're interested, if you're not interested, you know, cover your ears. <laughs> Bear with me a little bit. Um, but the point here is that the minute we start asking questions about ethics, all kinds of other questions open up. And usually, like if you go to Sunday school or, you know, you're looking for some poetic inspiration, nobody's interested in the broad range of questions that develop. So all the kind of questions that philosophers ask, we, about, we ask about what's good. That's ethics or political philosophy. We ask about what's beautiful. That's aesthetics. We ask about what we know. That's epistemology or theory of knowledge. We ask about what really is, where everything comes from, and where it's going. Ultimate reality, that's called metaphysics. All that. I'm so lucky that in my career, I get to talk about all this cool stuff. Nobody else gets to do this, just we the philosophers. <laughs> we have special opportunity. We could talk about truth, beauty, knowledge, goodness, the existence of God, and so on. It's amazing what we get to do as philosophers. But notice, by the way, that people often don't like to ask difficult questions about this stuff. You go to a scientist and you say to the scientist, how do you know that your scientific theory is true? They don't want to answer that question. They just want to do science, I mean, for the most part. You go to a religious person, you say, how do you know that your theory of ultimate reality is true? What you claim about God or reincarnation or et cetera, how do you know that it's true? 
Well, <laughs> nobody wants to talk about that kind of stuff. You go to an artist and say, what makes you think that what you're creating is beautiful? And the artist is mostly going to say, I'm busy doing art. I don't want to talk about that. And then guess what happens? They give you the hemlock, <laughs> and you end up dead. <laughs> you keep asking this kind of stuff. OK, Kant, I already introduced Kant to you. Kant asks three questions. There, you see that these questions are going to be parallel to those previous methodological distinctions. Kant asks, what can I know? What should I do? What may I hope for? What can I know? That's the theory of epistemology. What should I do? That's the theory of ethics. And what can I hope for? That's the question of religion and ultimate reality. And here's what Kant suggests, by the way. We don't know much. <laughs> it's pretty clear that we should respect persons as end in themselves. We don't really know what happens in the great big scheme of things, but we ought to hope that there's another life where good people are rewarded. We ought to hope that there is a reward for good people. Why should we hope that way? Because if we don't believe that good comes out in the end, there's kind of no point to being good. The condition for the possibility of ethics is to believe that somewhere, somehow, good triumphs over evil. I think that's right. Hope. OK. Then, again, we're just doing our introductory bit here about what philosophy and how philosophical ethics works. Do you see that this gets complicated? Do you, I mean, I, I dare to ask you. Maybe I shouldn't. What do you think about hope? Do you believe that in the end, good people ultimately are rewarded? Or is the universe indifferent to our suffering and our striving? That'll keep you up at night. Think about that one. OK, so then when we do moral philosophy, so now we're, we're honing in just on theory of the good, right, on ethics, asking what should we do. This gets really darn complicated also. Philosophers divide this up. And again, you don't need to know all this for um, daily consumption, but you might be interested. Metaethics is a question about whether or not there is such a thing as ethics. You know, scientists don't ask those kind of questions. Scientists don't ask, is there such a thing as science? But ethics professors ask ourselves every day, what in the heck are we doing? <laughs> How do we know that what we're talking about is actually anything based in reality or that we have any knowledge of this stuff whatsoever? You see in this realm of things this question of whether values are relative or subjective. Have you heard the word relativism before? Relativism? Have you heard that word? Relativism means that there are no values. There's just perspectives. And values are relative to our perspectives. There then would be old people values and young people values. There would be Clovis values and Fresno values. There would be Christian values and Hindu values. There would just be perspectives and no real answer to the question of what are the real values. That's a problem, isn't it? You know people in Clovis? And you go over there, and they're like, in Clovis, we do this. And you're like, in Fresno, we do that. And then pretty soon, you don't go to Clovis anymore. <laughs> right? uh, relativism leaves us without any way of interacting or deciding what's right or wrong. It's a dead end. It's a skeptical problem. OK. Assuming we could solve all that, which is very difficult to do, <laughs> assuming we could solve all that, then we talk about what actually is right or wrong. So now we're actually getting into the thick of it. And here's the problem. It turns out that there's multiple theories about what's right or what's wrong. I already showed you two theories. Your mom says, how do I look? The one theory says, tell her the truth. The other theory says, make her feel better. Two different theories about what's right or what's wrong. We call this value pluralism, that there's more than one answer to the ethical question. And this is difficult. I don't know if you've encountered this yourself. Have you tried to make decisions about what to do in your life? And you sort of make a list. And you're like, on the one hand, I should tell the truth. On the other hand, I should remain loyal to my friends. On the other hand, I might get arrested. On the third hand, I don't care. <laughs> and so on and so on, right? There's multiple points of view. The relativist, go back up here a second. You hear how this actually leads us back up here. The relativist says, can't decide. There's just perspectives. Hindus are going to do this, and Christians are going to do that, and those people in Clovis are going to do that other thing. Not that there can't be Christians and Hindus in Clovis, after all, but you get the point. 
Okay, and then we apply it to cases and examples, and it gets even more complicated. Okay, so that's part one. Moving on, part two. <clears throat> Talking about how we actually make ethical decisions, and this gets complicated. Now, if you want to follow along on your handout, and I don't have a copy for myself, <clears throat> on your handout, we are looking at this side, which is ethical decision making. And if you're interested in this, we have this posted on our Ethics Center website. Uh, we, I've used this in many different contexts, and you know, we could spend five hours talking about this or five minutes. How about five minutes? Sound better? It's late, after all. You got homework to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know. <laughs> uh, so you're confronted with some ethical decisions, some, something that seems to require you to make a decision. First, you got to get the facts straight. A little more difficult than you might think. For example, I'm, in my class on campus at Fresno State, this week we're talking about environmental ethics. And there's actually factual disputes, like about climate change, for example. We got to get the facts right. And sometimes the facts are disputed. Sometimes we can't even move beyond that, because we don't know what the facts are, or we don't know how to resolve factual disputes. But let's assume we can figure that out. We're going to consult the scientists or whoever. But sometimes scientists disagree, it's complicated. Anyway, then we got to figure out who has to do what? Whose job is it to make a judgment about something? Whose job is it to take action on something? And you must know this because you have friends like this. There are some people who think it's their business to get involved in your business. You know those people? <laughs> you know them or you're one of them? You're one, <laughs> you're one of them. Well. <laughs> Bless your heart. Some people think that they have an obligation to make everyone's life better. Busybodies, nitpickers, right? And so on. Maybe you do have an obligation to make other people's lives better, or maybe you have an obligation to leave them alone to make their own mistakes. It gets complicated. Here's something that you need to keep in mind. If you're a teacher in a school, you actually have obligations to do things that are difficult ethically you are required to report child abuse. You are required to give people bad grades. You are required to talk to parents about stuff that's going wrong in school. And guess what? Teachers don't like to do that. It's uncomfortable. It's unpleasant, but you have to, and it's your obligation. Now, students don't have that obligation. You're not an obligatory reporter. You're not obliged to report stuff, although maybe ethically you should. There's no legal reason behind it, and so you see how interesting and complicated that gets. Okay, then we move to step three. So you have to ask yourself whether it's your job to get involved. Then we move to step three. What kind of value judgments do you make? Are you, is, is your judgment aesthetic? Meaning it's just about taste and beauty, right? So sometimes we think it's a moral conflict, but it's just a matter of like, I just don't like that kind of thing. Not ethically, but just a matter of taste, right? This gets complicated, but we're going to move on to number four, which is apply value systems. And you can see on my list here, there's several value systems. There are different ways people think about ethics. And it turns out it gets to be very difficult to figure out how to apply these. I'm going to show you these in one second. Uh, we have to then think about how value conflicts happen. And then the last, and I'm going to show you both of these in a second, the last and most important thing is guess what? You're probably going to screw it up. Nobody makes the right decision every time. And here's where things really go off the rails, because often people just make a decision, and then they just blast forward and say, ah, I did my best. I don't really care anymore. There's this phrase that people talk about where they say the cover-up is worse than the crime. Have you heard that phrase before? Because people don't admit when they make a mistake. And actually, like one bit of word of advice to you is we all make mistakes and there's no shame in admitting it. There's actually shame in not admitting it because then you can't improve. You can't go on and make the world any better if we're just lying about ourselves all the time. Okay, pause for a second just to catch our breaths because, geez, that's already 20 minutes in. And some of you are looking a little bit sleepy. Sorry to say. Everything okay? <laughs> uh, Inspiration. So Martin Luther King, you may have heard of him. Maybe you didn't, haven't heard of Maya Angelou, but you probably heard of Martin Luther King. Martin Luther King has this idea 
that in the long run, morality works. If we just keep working at it, and if we do this kind of stuff, and if we admit our mistakes, and if people would just take responsibility for their wrongdoing, things will get better. That's King's fundamental article of faith. Things will get better. As he says, the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends towards justice. Bad things happen to good people. You know it's true, because it probably happened to someone, either you or someone in your life. Bad things happen to good people. But this kind of moral faith says that in the long run, if you stick with it, good will come out. Okay? It's not by accident, by the way, that King is a Christian pastor, because this is a kind of Christian view, that ultimately there is a structure, a moral structure to the universe. But just let me tell you, that that's not only a Christian view. The same view holds in multiple religious traditions. We could talk about that if you like as well. Okay, how about another pause just to wake you up? You know pearls before swine? I actually think young people don't read the comics anymore. Any of you read comics? A couple, very few, and mostly the older people who read the comics. Because mostly you don't read the newspaper anymore, so if you don't read the newspaper, you don't run into the comics. Well, Pearls Before Swine is one of my father-in-law's favorite comics. He calls me every, did you see Pearls Before Swine, my 80-some-odd-year father-in-law? Anyway, this one, uh, uh, the rat says, I've concluded that the key to living an ethical life is to always pause before I do anything and ask myself that key moral question, which is what? Can I get away with it? <laughs> I don't think that's moral. Well, not if you get caught. <laughs> um, look, you look up Pearls Before Swine. There's some hilarious stuff in Pearls Before Swine. But maybe young people don't even know you're supposed to read from left to right on comics. <laughs> I mean, there's like a set of conventions about how to read comics, you know, that I learned growing up because the newspaper was on the table every morning and my dad would say, here, read this, you know. Um, okay, so... Now we're in the middle of this handout, and we're not going to go into any detail about this, but my, my uh, point with showing you this is to emphasize that value pluralism thing. There are different ways to make moral decisions, and people disagree. But despite the difference here, guess what? All of these approaches to morality say that rat is a big jerk. There actually is broad agreement and consensus among all of these different theories that it is wrong to lie, it is wrong to cheat, it is wrong to steal, it is wrong to kill, it is wrong to rape. The differences here have to do with how you get to the conclusion, but there's actually vast agreement about those conclusions. And if you want to make this even more complicated and bring religion into the mix, Almost every religion reaches the same set of moral conclusions, despite their differences in metaphysical worldviews. You know the word metaphysics by now from earlier? What's metaphysics mean? Metaphysics. <coughs> Boom! He got it. Theory of ultimate reality. Gold star for you on the cross-country team, representing the cross-country team up in the front. <laughs> um, OK, so these different theories, we already saw two of them. Kant, we started with Kant, remember? Kant says, respect persons. Don't use them as tools. So that's his idea. And utilitarianism, that's John Stuart Mill, the happiness guy. Mill says, promote the greatest happiness for the greatest number of people. OK? And there are others, and I'm not going to get into the details here. You come take my ethics class. We'll spend a couple weeks talking about this. And it turns out to be kind of interesting. OK, now we are moving down to number five on this list, which is that sometimes, given those different theories, we end up with dilemmas. A dilemma is when there are two things and they're both right. Two choices and they're both good. That's a dilemma. Like, mom says, how do I look? On the one hand, you should be honest with her. So honesty, truth. On the other hand, you should be nice to her or loyal to her feelings or whatever. Truth versus loyalty is one way of describing that. Okay? Um, this guy, Rushworth Kidder, is a really great, interesting author. He wrote this book, How Good People Make Tough Choices, and he gives lots of examples of people that screw it up. The one, in fact, you're way too young to know this, but uh, Chernobyl, 
You ever hear of Chernobyl? You heard of it. What do you know about Chernobyl? <laughs> You've seen it on YouTube. Nuclear reactor that melts down in Russia. And the problem of Chernobyl is these guys were just screwing around, running a sort of experiment without proper controls. It was a completely avoidable accident. I don't know if that's what you discovered in your YouTube research, but it's an ethical lapse. It's a problem. Science run amok without proper restraint, OK? Anyway, Kidder tells us that there's an important difference between dilemmas and temptations. Now, let me tell you how this works in the real world, that when people do something wrong, they often say, it was a dilemma. Well, I had two options, and both were pretty good, and I didn't know how to decide, so I just chose that one. They're lying when they say this, but it looks like this. Imagine you're, I don't know, in charge of a club or something, and you got a pile of money. You've been doing a fundraiser, you got all the money, and you think, hmm, I need to go buy some ice cream across the street and to treat my friends. Be nice to do that for my friends. Loyalty to my friends. I'm making my friends happy. It's the happiness theory. You take the money and you go across the street and you buy the ice cream for your friends. Is that a dilemma? Were there two good things in conflict? Well, it's, the, the problem is you've stolen the money from the club, right? Your real obligation is to not take the money. That's stealing, isn't it? But do you hear how you could turn that into a dilemma? Actually, I'm just applying the happiness theory, man. We're going to take that money and treat everyone to ice cream. It's supposed to go for something school-oriented, but next thing you know, you got a bunch of people eating ice cream. It's not a dilemma. It's a temptation. You know what the wrong thing to do is, but you do it anyway. And then you know how it usually works? You create a cockamamie story. We call this a rationalization. You create a story that makes it seem OK, and you use the language of a dilemma to try to explain it away. Right? The thing about a dilemma is both choices are obviously good. So in the case if I have a pile of money and I'm taking the money, there's only one choice that's obviously good, which is to fulfill your obligation to steward that money and save it and use it for the club. You follow me on this? Here's, let me just say this differently. There are very, very few dilemmas, and they're very difficult, and there's lots of temptations, and it's very easy to succumb to the temptation. Because we're human, after all. We like to take the easy way out, and we like ice cream. <laughs> okay, so here's a typical dilemma paradigm. Kidder talks about truth versus loyalty. We talked about that a little bit. Individual versus community, right? Where you're thinking about what's good for one person versus what's good for all people. Short-term interest versus long-term interest and justice versus mercy. How about this one? I'm sure you've thought about this before. Teachers confront this very often. Student turns in their homework late or, I don't know, misses a test or whatever, and then they come and they have a really good excuse. They overslept. <laughs> no, better excuse than that. They, I don't know, got in a car accident. There was a robbery in the house. Somebody ended up in the hospital. I mean, you can imagine this. It's interesting and deep. And by the way, students have these experiences. I know Fresno State students, there's amazing difficulties that some of our students uh, confront. So as a teacher, justice requires me to treat everyone the same. So if the deadline was this, I have to keep to that deadline. If it says I mark you down 10% if you miss the deadline, I have to do that to be fair to everyone. That's justice. But you come to me and say, but professor, but teacher, X, Y, and Z happen. I should be merciful, maybe, and make an exception for you because of the nature of your individuality and your special circumstances big, big conflict between mercy and justice. If you don't believe that that happens, I'm sure it's happened in your own house with your parents. Some, you do something wrong, and the parent says, look, here's, you did it, you did it wrong, I'm taking away whatever privilege, and then you plead for mercy. And sometimes parents say, well, I love you so much that I'm going to go soft on you and let you get away with it. Um, OK, so let's apply this to some examples. We're going to head towards these case studies. Everyone with me in a wake? Are you sure? <laughs> OK. I know it's late. I know you're high school kids. And you know, I told you, my son's a senior in high school. And at, since, he, since the sports season ended, now he just naps all the time. So I get it. Um, OK. 
<clears throat> this is what's called the trolley problem. So I want you to help me answer this one. This is you standing at a switch on a track. There's a runaway train running down the track. Do you see where it's headed? For the, toward these five people. You are standing there. You have the switch. And you can see the train is going to run over the five. If you pull the switch, the train is going to switch off the main track and end up and kill this person. He said, damn. <laughs> Whoa, OK. What are you going to do? Don't look. You're going to run away. <laughs> so by running away, guess what? You killed five people. What? Not directly. Not directly? What do you mean? Pulled the switch. You, like, it was already going towards those five people, so you pulled the switch. Then you definitely killed them. Ooh, very clever, right? You could run away and say, I didn't have anything to do with it. Those five people were dead anyway. It's not my fault, right? If you flip the switch, now isn't it your fault that the one person dies? OK, we, you can talk about this. I mean, we could spend a couple weeks talking about the difference between doing and allowing, the difference between acting and permitting, if you think about that distinction, right? If you run away, you've allowed the train to kill people. You haven't killed them. What do you think the people on the track are going to say as you're running away? <laughs> Come back! You're killing us! I mean, they're going to think that you're responsible somehow. OK. This is, a, this is a tricky situation. This is a kind of dilemma scenario. Not, I, I think it's not quite a dilemma, but it sort of is. Um, what do you think, I mean, typically, what's the right answer here? What? Kill one, save five. Isn't that pretty obviously the right answer? You think that's the right answer? There's no right answer. Now, maybe we've got a dilemma. Maybe we're in one of these value pluralism relativist problems. Why do you think there's no right answer? You're guilty either way. But shouldn't you be less guilty than more guilty? I mean, the fact that you're switching would make you feel like you're guilty. Because you're actually changing it. If you do this thing, you put a little energy into it, and now you're responsible for it. You're guilty for killing the one. And even if you run away, you're still going to feel guilty. You're not it's true. I mean, you actually have the opportunity to do something ethically heroic. You could save by people. He's running away. <laughs> save us, they say. He's running away. <laughs> Coward. <laughs> no offense. You could be a hero and save the five people, right? Do you hear the difficulty? Now let's make it even more difficult, OK? I mean, here, again, utilitarian, who is about happiness and maximizing good outcomes, the utilitarian says, no problem. We kill the one. We save the five. That's the clear answer from a utilitarian standpoint. Except, what if that's Hitler, Stalin, Mussolini? <laughs> Name your favorite. And over here is your grandmother. Oh, you say. <laughs> It gets complicated, doesn't it? I have students write about this, and they, I, I watch them in class, and they're like, God, should I kill Hitler or my grandma? <laughs> and I'm, I look at them like, why is that a puzzle to you? It shouldn't be that difficult. Um, I guess it depends who your grandma is. Yeah. Um, OK. <clears throat> this. This scenario, by the way, it's called the trolley problem. It shows up in the philosophy literature. There's been lots and lots of articles written about it. And in fact, in terms of psychology and psychological experiments, they've even put people in MRI machines, you know, checking how brain activation happens, brain, some brain scans, confront them with this, and then see which parts of the brain fire up. It's just a fascinating thing because it gets you thinking, and it's not easy, not obvious. It's difficult. OK, so now what I'd like you to do, now you're kind of primed to think about this, um, would, I would like you to turn to a neighbor and talk about this case study. So flip this over. At the top here, you have the dilemma and kind of moral frameworks to kind of guide this. 
let me read this with you, and then I, I want you to talk with a neighbor for a couple minutes. So Maria is the captain of Team X. She's the, te uh, the team's coach, Mrs. Ahab, is very strict. She yells a lot. She sits players out for minor infractions, late to practice, insubordination. The team is good, but they have lost games when their best players have been benched. A couple of the best players have been getting into trouble lately, toward the end of the season as the team is gearing up for the state tournament. Players are grumbling about how strict Mrs. Ahab is and how she's ruining their chance to win. What should Maria, as the team captain, do? What values should she think about? Does it matter that they're about to win the state championship? What would this be different if this team was losing? So what do, you, get, do you understand the scenario? The coach seems to be unreasonable, and the kids want to win, and the coach is punishing some students that could ruin their chance of winning. OK? Turn to a neighbor for a minute or two and think what Maria should do. I thought I recognized it. Okay, you, good. But yeah, I went to Camp Royal, and so like, I, I loved it. And I mean, like, I mean, what was your ethics? How was your good. Idea? Good, 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 good. So, yeah. yeah, thanks for letting me know. Yeah, that's cool. Okay, I hear that you're done talking mostly. The boo, there was like silence after a minute. Uh, volunteer to tell me what you think Maria should do? How about in the back row over here? One of you guys from the back row. What do you think? You don't want to talk about it. Okay. What? Say it a little bit louder. To the players. Talk to the players. Should she talk to the coach? No? Talk to the players, get the players to behave better? and the players don't behave better, then what should she do? What do you think? Is that, the, is that the conclusion? She should just talk to the players and get them to behave better? Is that likely to happen? Does it matter that they're about to win a championship? Should she, let me, let me just make this more blunt. Should she ask the coach to make an exception for these outstanding players who are real jerks, should she tell the coach, look, we want to win. We want to win, so please make an exception for these players. Does it make sense to make an exception for these players? What do you think? They should make an exception for these players. Yeah, because they're going to win, right? Even though the rules say you have to behave this way, and the coach is saying you're going to get in trouble, they should make an exception for these outstanding players. Is that right? No? no? Why not? Uh, because you clearly have rules at the beginning, so you should know what you're supposed to be doing. You have responsibilities. It's not fair for, like, I don't understand, like, you're going to win a championship and everything, but, like, you know your responsibilities from the beginning of the year for the season. So we're going to bench these players, and then we're going to lose. I mean, they should, they knew that it's not only depending on them, it depends on the and they know what their coach's rules were, so they should have been following those rules. What do you think? She wants the players benched. It's only fair. The rules said X, Y, and Z. Here's what we ought to do, right? What do you think? I think they should get a chance. They should get a chance, he says. Yeah, come on. Yeah, I think they should get a chance, but like get punished for 
Yeah. Oh, punish them later. How are you going to punish them later when the season's over? Yeah. This is one of these conflicts between the good of the team, which is the community. I don't know what's going on over there. <laughs> um, the good of the team, the good, like the team wants to win, all the players want to win, versus uh, treating individuals equitably and fairly and applying the rules fairly. There's a justice versus mercy conflict here as well. OK. Um, anything else about this case? I, I love that this one student said, we're just going to talk to the other players and get them to behave better. It's a very optimistic view. <clears throat> Do we need to pause? Sorry. OK. <laughs> um, all right, next one. Frank, the valedictorian. So Frank is one of the best students at school. Why? He has a chance to be one of the school's valedictorians. His school honors every student graduating with a high GPA. He's heard lots of rumors about students cheating in certain classes, including a couple of key AP classes. Frank is not involved, nor does he have any real proof that cheating is going on. But many of his friends claim it's happening. He suspects that a few students have received A's that they probably don't deserve. The cheating probably won't affect his grade, since none of the courses are graded on a curve. What should he do? Should he tell the teachers that he seems to know that there's some cheating going on? Or should he let it slide? Because what's the difference to him? Does it affect him? Maybe we'll do this one instead of in groups. Just have you tell me. How about in this row? What do you think? Sh you, you, imagine you're in your own case. You think that cheating's going on. You're hearing about cheating on campus. Should you keep your mouth shut, or should you tell someone? Uh, I would wait till there's uh, concrete evidence. OK. Notice back to gather the facts, get the facts straight. Do you have an obligation to do an investigation to figure out what's going on? Uh, not really. Could just be a rumor, and it's kind of none of your business, you say? Yeah. Anybody think that you have an obligation to let a teacher know that you hear that there's some cheating going on? What do you think? Yeah. Yes. If they are, and which will bring your grade down. It's going to affect you if there's cheating going on. You should tell someone about it, right? Now let's switch the scenario up a little bit further. Uh, and by the way, this is a case that happened in Fresno. You may remember this. So uh, I won't tell you which school it was. So this guy, Frank, he's going to audition to be a commencement speaker. He's going to speak at commencement. <clears throat> He wants uh, to use his speech to talk about cheating at his school. He suspects that if he honestly proposes a speech about cheating, he's not going to be selected. So he's about to audition for the valedictorian speech. He thinks that if he actually admits that he's going to talk about cheating, they're not going to pick him. right? So he's going to give a phony speech. But when the real day of graduation comes, he's going to say, the anti-cheating speech. Should you audition with a phony speech so you can get your foot in the door and then stand up at graduation and talk about all the cheating that's happening at your school? You don't think so? Why not? Do you hear the problem? If you start talking about this cheating, then everything's going to fall apart at the school. People are going to, the teachers are going to get fired. It's going to be bad. Uh, and he's lying anyway, so he shouldn't lie. If you already thought maybe he shouldn't even say anything, what do you think? Audition with a phony speech? 
in order to get the word out so that truth can be revealed, right? Good idea. The truth needs to be spoken. And if you have to lie in order to speak the truth, shouldn't you lie along the way? Tell us what you think. I think that's like good. And besides, you want to be like affected by the grades going in? They're already graduating because this is graduation, right? So if you expose them on now, it doesn't matter. They're finished It's only the juniors that are going to be screwed over. <laughs> Not the seniors, right? And if, the, and if the teachers get fired, it's their own dumb fault for letting cheating happen. It would be cool if he spoke truth to power that way. Um, okay, so then let's get a little bit further. And this is actually what happened here in a Fresno school. I'm not, not going to tell you which school. Maybe some of the adults remember this one. Frank is not selected to give the valedictorian speech. So should Frank then send his speech to the Fresno Bee? and expose the cheating scandal at the school by publishing it at large in the press. What do you think? Tell the truth. This is truth. What about loyalty to the school? He was going to expose them at their own graduation, so certain people would have heard about that, too. Shouldn't he keep his mouth shut? I mean, the school's being discredited now. You're okay with discrediting the school? All those kids at graduation who are bragging about their high GPAs, and then you say they're a bunch of phonies and their GPAs are not real? You're undermining? Well, they didn't say anything. They didn't say anything. What do you mean? Uh, they lied about it, too. So they should be discredited. They're all liars. Yeah. The whole school's phony. You're going to bring it down. Aha. Uh -huh. So this takes us back to the get the facts right. The worst possible thing, publishing it in the Fresno Bee and making it, yeah. Well, this goes back to this. I see we're, we're heading, we got a few more minutes left. Um, this goes back to the question of who has what obligation and to what extent. Does a student have an obligation to publish what they know about a school in the newspaper? Is that the step you should take? What is the extent of your obligation? How far should you go? Uh, so again, you can probably figure this out yourself online. But this happened a few years ago here in Fresno. The Fresno Bee published this scathing editorial by someone who had graduated from a high school who said, basically, it's a bunch of cheaters over there at that high school. Uh, and he said he should know because he was one of them, <laughs> more or less. Um, and this is not the only time that this kind of thing has happened. I've kind of done some uh, previous ethics talk, I mean, a few years ago. Some kid had gotten into like Princeton, Brown, Yale, like these really elite colleges. And then he wrote a piece in the Atlantic Monthly where he said, I am an honor student. I graduated with a 4.5 GPA. I got into Princeton, and I cheated in every one of my classes. And he said, the article went on, he said, I felt that I needed to cheat because the teachers sucked, the school was dishonest, and everybody else was cheating anyway. But do you see the problem if you're one of those kids who graduated from that school, you're part of the community, there's this sort of feel good, aren't we great? <laughs> Look how smart we are and all of our students get into these high achieving colleges. And so it goes. That doesn't happen here at Fresno High, cheating. You're very carefully not moving your heads one way or another. <laughs> um, OK, so let's head towards the conclusion. I'm happy to have a couple questions if you want whatever you want to talk about. Um, so what did we do? We looked at philosophy kind of in general. And then we talked about moral dilemmas. There are some genuine moral dilemmas. They're very difficult. They keep you up at night. And sometimes you really just don't know what to do. There are also lots of temptations, and we usually lie about them. We pretend that it's OK to take the money when we know it's not. But we do it because we want to do it. So we have to avoid the temptations. We have to realize that 
people make mistakes. Even very good people have made big mistakes in their lives. And the thing is to be honest about it and to admit it and to learn from it and to move on, to apologize, to make amends, to restore trust, and so on. If we do that, then we can get better. And in fact, actually, I believe we are getting better. I think actually our culture and civilization is improving, despite that there's some doom and gloom stuff out there in the world. I think we're getting better. And we should hope in the long run, like Martin Luther King put it, that the arc of the moral universe bends towards justice and the good. So there we have, what, five minutes left? Is there any time for questions or? Um, Arguments, anger, <laughs> passion. You're going to go write your thing in the Fresno Bee now about <laughs> what's going on at your school. Yeah. Can you, uh, so we've probably got a lot of seniors in the room. Can you talk about the value of studying philosophy and ethics hmm. in, in today's Practical world where everyone's going to go work for Google and you know, code and make a million dollars. <laughs> the dream. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, at Fresno State, um, I teach a class that has 300 students. It's an intro to ethics class. Every semester, 300 students. The class is jammed full of students because nursing, engineering, uh, uh, public health, and several other majors require their students to take ethics classes. Every profession has a code of ethics. So if you're going to become a teacher, you need to think about ethics. If you're going to become an engineer or computer scientist, you need to think about ethics. If you're going to become a coach, you need to think about ethics. If you're going to become a nurse or a doctor or a lawyer, you need to think about ethics. In fact, nurses, lawyers, doctors have ongoing ethics training. Right? The Bar Association actually publishes uh, an ethics column in the Bar Association Journal, which reports Scandals, how people screwed it up ethically. So my argument is that any profession, I mean, even the plumber, because I got ripped off over the weekend by a plumber. <laughs> even the plumber needs ethics, right? The guy looking under the hood of your car, I mean, is it broken or not, buddy? And he can easily lie to me and then pocket the money, right? There's a, a different talk I give about business and why ethics is essential for business. But... To build trust and relationships, you have to be ethical. One ethical lapse just destroys trust, and then your business falls apart. You know, A lawyer who does something unethical, he's not going to get any clients. The other lawyers and the judges are not going to want to work with him. You know, so I think, it's, I, mean, I think it's really essential for any profession. And then, of course, we're all human beings. And we kind of think that it would be good to be good. <laughs> Maybe you're too young to realize this, but you get to be a little bit older and you start to think like the end is near and you want to be believe that you did something good in your life. You know, uh, you want to be remembered for the good things you did, not for the scandals, not for the violations, not for the shortcuts that you took, you know. So. All the 16 to 17 year olds are like, yeah, right. <laughs> you'll get there, you know, the old people wave their fingers, you'll get there and you'll realize this is true at some point. <laughs>